thanks very much for the invitation to come speak to you. I'm going to give uh, three lectures. The first is going to be on an amazing fact about our universe that basically makes cosmology possible, which is that linear perturbation theory in general relativity and hydrodynamics can describe almost everything we know about the universe. This is a theory called a uh, lambda CDM. So I'll explain to you what that is. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about uh, cosmic inflation, which is a theory that we think is responsible for setting up the initial conditions that then evolve into galaxies and you know, the overall evolution of the universe that we see around us today. And then in the third lecture I'm going to talk about uh, observations. So I was supposed to talk about the CMB today. To do that justice, I think I need to get into a little bit more detail on the other types of fluctuations, like in dark matter and whatnot. So I'll probably get to very little of the observational side today. So just wait for lecture three, and that'll basically be about that. So what's the model of the universe? What kind of mathematics do I need to describe the universe as a whole? So almost all of cosmology is basically general relativity and relativistic hydrodynamics. So here are the fundamental players that we need to worry about. So for general relativity, uh, we need to know what the metric is. That's the fundamental quantity. Uh, there's fluid densities and fluid velocities. That's basically the matter that inhabits the universe. So stuff like uh, baryons, dark matter, uh, dark energy, all of the stuff of the universe. And then there are the laws. Okay, so we have Einstein's equations, which we've seen briefly. This is the continuity equation. It's basically the, the relativistic generalization of the conservation of, of momentum and energy. <laughs> and this is the energy momentum tensor for fluids. So I don't think we've seen that yet. This is basically some combination of the energy density and pressure for different types of fluid. Here are those fluid velocities. And then there's another piece having to do with the pressure. So that's it. Okay, so you could go home now. You know everything you need to know about cosmology. You just need to go off and solve these equations. So the one thing, well, I guess you're not done yet, right? Because these are partial differential equations. Um, Einstein's equation, G mu nu. Here, this is uh, what, what Anthony wrote down as uh, the Ricci tensor minus uh, G mu nu times the Ricci scalar. It's the Einstein tensor. Yeah, there's a factor of a half. With a half. Thanks, Joel. Come on, we're theorists. What's a factor of a half? Um, <laughs> so that's, that's a partial differential equation because uh, the Ricci tensor involves derivatives of the metric. And the continuity equation is a differential equation. There's the covariant derivative. So it's a set of coupled PDEs, and therefore I need initial conditions. So what are those? Well, an amazing fact about the universe is that an appropriate set of initial conditions that can give us what we see today is basically some homogeneous piece, which is just a function of time, plus some small perturbations. Okay, so the metric, the uh, density of fluids, the fluid velocities, this can all be written as some background homogeneous piece plus something small. So that's, that's the deltas. Delta means small. By small, I mean small compared to the background quantities. Why? OK, well, that's lecture two. So for now, just accept that this is an amazing fact of the universe that basically allows us to do cosmology. It's an extraordinary convenience, and we'll see why. So this is part of the reason why it's an extraordinary convenience, because I can take uh, this equation, which we've heard a few times and is really difficult to solve. Um, it's a highly nonlinear partial differential equation. Uh, it's, it's hard to come by exact solutions. So we can take this nasty mess, and we can split it up into a piece that describes the homogeneous backgrounds. Uh, Joel presented that. That was the Friedman equations. We'll see that in a minute again. And then we have some set of equations that describe the fluctuations. And the fluctuations just live in this background. And so 
And that's nothing deeper than saying, you know, we look out into the, the night sky, well, we don't see some like crazy mess of crap that we don't really know how to explain. We see some more or less homogeneous universe with galaxies and structure in it, right? So it's really a background plus fluctuations that live on the background. So let's just briefly review the homogeneous universe. I'll go pretty fast because we've already heard about this today. So to describe the homogeneous universe, uh, we need to know the types of fluids and the densities today. So the types of fluids uh, here are labeled by the index I. And uh, how are they distinguished? Well, for perfect fluids, they're just distinguished by this equation of state parameter which tells us how the pressure is related to the density. That's this parameter w. It's a constant for us. Okay? And for different types of fluids, it will have different values. And we also need to know, well, what, what kind of initial conditions. So that's the type of fluid. This is the initial conditions. So for example, uh, we could express that as the, the densities of these various fluids that we observe today. And for the linear universe, which we'll go into great depth, we want to classify these as basically, you know, some set of initial conditions for these deltas. Well, it would be pointless for me to try and, and evolve, you know, every exact position of every exact fluctuation that turns into galaxies and all the interesting structure that we see today. A better idea is to try and characterize the statistics of these inhomogeneities, right? We want to find some sort of coarse grain observable, some, some properties of the probability that's distributions uh, for these different deltas. Okay, so <clears throat> the extra baggage that comes with that is to compare with anything, we're going to sort of have to make this assumption, uh, this is a totally standard assumption, uh, when you're trying to work with, with statistical quantities, which is that, that our universe is typical. We see some typical realization from, from drawn from these probability distributions. Okay, so that's, that's the initial conditions that we needed. Uh, and by the end of the day, we'll hope to cover the, the, the basic model of the universe, okay? So this is the six-parameter model of the universe that describes almost everything we know, say, about the distribution of galaxies, the cosmic microwave background, etc. Joel's already mentioned this. It's got six parameters. So there's three parameters, which are basically how much of each component of these different fluids do we have? And of course, the dominant components in our universe seem to be dark matter, dark energy. Uh, there's ordinary matter, which is some small slice of the pie. That's you know all the luminous matter, stars, galaxies, etc. And then radiation, which is some tiny little piece of the pie that we don't even bother drawing today. Uh, there's two parameters. It turns out we need to characterize this set of probability distributions. Okay. It's a really simple set of probability distributions. They're all just uh, sort of Gaussian and characterized by, by just uh, an amplitude and some, something that describes how things change with scale. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, and then for this EMB, there's one extra parameter, uh, which is the optical depth. And that's because the universe is cloudy. So uh, CMB photons coming to us have to pass through some kind of crap, you know, like uh, uh, the universe becomes reionized, there's all sorts of electrons and protons and photons that can scatter on them. So we need, to, we need to know how cloudy the universe is to figure out what the amplitude of the fluctuations we see are today, here. Okay, so six parameter model of the universe, GR, hydrodynamics, and that's it, right? So, so now you really can go home. Uh, if you go find some computer simulation of the universe, which I guess Joel will tell us about uh, tomorrow, then, then you can just figure out what happens. Thursday. Thursday, yeah. Then you can just figure out what happens, okay? So you take some initially small fluctuations, uh, and then you just evolve these equations, and stuff, you don't even need GR, you can just do Newtonian gravity, it's good enough. And initially small fluctuations collapse to form galaxies, stars, the structure uh, that we see in the universe, and that's it. <clears throat> So the rest is details, and I've got a long time left in my talk, so you might guess that I'm going to fill in some of these details. So, so that was really fast. 
Now let's slow down and fill in some of these details. Any questions before I move on on the big picture? So that's really it. Those laws, those initial conditions, evolve them. You can know anything you want to know about about this model. Let's fill in the details. So, uh, actually, before we get there, we should we should give thanks. We should give thanks to the incredible simplicity of the universe, right? Because if we lived in a non-linear universe, well, I don't know. If, first of all, if we can, actually, I can't answer that question because it's so hard to find exact solutions to Einstein's equations. Maybe there is some super non-linear universe that admits enough, you know, small-scale structure for life and stuff to form. Who knows? Uh, so, you know, GR is just this messy, messy theory. It's totally nonlinear. So, if we lived in a nonlinear universe, inferring the state of the early universe would be like asking, you know, based on the weather today, what was the weather like 100 million years ago? So, what's another super nonlinear system? It's like the climate system on the Earth. You have to know how physics communicates across all sorts of different scales. Uh, there's all sorts of interactions that you just have to parameterize because it's too complicated to solve for things exactly. Uh, and, and it would be a mess, right? We couldn't do that. We can't do that today. Uh, we'll never be able to do that. Another problem is that in GR, there is no general classification of metrics in four dimensions. So given that, uh, how would I really go about characterizing the initial conditions? There, there's no even in principle classification scheme that I could imagine creating. And then it's nonlinear, so there's you know shock waves and singularities and all sorts of things that we don't really know how to contend with. They require sort of extra rules to put into those equations. We don't know what those rules are, so it would be hard to make progress. Yeah. When you say there's no general classification of metrics, do you mean there's no way to put um, a unique measure on all the different kinds of possible metrics? That would be one way of putting it. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's no measure. That's, that's a good way of Okay, so we'll contrast that with the linear universe, the universe that we live in. So there's you know, simple evolution. You, you stick something in, you get something out, and no complications. Okay, There's no crazy, messy interactions. So given the state of the universe today, it's possible to infer the state of the universe in the past. You can, have, you can, you can think of all the structure of the universe as living in a background. That's an incredible convenience. So we can analyze the evolution of the background and the growth of structure separately. That's nice. There's a simple classification of initial conditions and metric degrees of freedom. We'll see, we just go to Fourier space, and that gives us a way of classifying all the different possible fluctuations. And the physics on different scales evolves totally independently. And what that's going to mean is that I can take this set of really ugly nonlinear partial differential equations and turn them into a set of completely tractable ordinary differential equations some of which are coupled, but they don't couple across scales. So I can evaluate things happening on different scales totally separately. So all that is really, really nice. And I guess the take-home point for the whole talk is just that if things weren't that way, then there would be no modern science of cosmology, because it would just be too difficult. So let's give thanks. OK, so now, finally, let's get to the details. As advertised, uh, I'll try and go pretty fast through the first part, because Joel already covered most of it. So the homogeneous universe. Here's the timeline. Um, of course, the universe starts very hot and dense and becomes very cool and diffuse as it expands. And here are some highlights. So I guess the most important highlights today will be here, when neutral atoms form, that's when the CMB is released. Uh, here, when the first galaxies and stars form. So in this window here, this is really the linear universe over most scales. Uh, and then today, 13.7 billion years after all this, uh, and then what started it? Big question mark. We'll see a little bit tomorrow about what might have set up the initial conditions, this theory called cosmic inflation. 
So here's the metric again. We'll just work with a flat Robertson Walker metric uh, for, for, for the rest of this talk. Uh, there can be a spatial curvature, but forget about it. We don't observe it for now. Let's let's just push that under the rug. I actually have a question over there. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, so I just back a little bit from um, just the comparison between non-linear and linear dynamics. Yeah. Following on from the last question, I take it that if you have a linear dynamics, it's somehow easy to specify a measure of the different possible metrics. Is that the sort of so uh, it's possible to define a measure, okay. but what the precise measure is would depend on where those initial conditions are coming from. I guess I would put it as possible to classify the set of initial conditions. We'll see it's just going to be the amplitude of different Fourier moments effectively, okay. and that's enough. And where did those amplitudes come from, that's a question for tomorrow where we'll actually talk about where they come Okay, so there's the timeline. There's the metric for a flat, homogeneous, isotropic universe. This is the background part. Uh, so one comment about coordinates. In this metric, these x's are known as co-moving coordinates. So co-moving coordinates uh, basically divide out by the expansion of the background. So some constant co-moving distance between these two lines would be a growing physical distance between these two lines uh, in physical coordinates. So co-moving coordinates just divide out by the expansion, but keep in mind that the physical distance in a constant co-moving interval is actually increasing with time as the universe expands. There's another convenience, which is to introduce something called the conformal time. So. Uh, Here's the metric in conformal time. You can see all that's happened is that now I've got an a squared multiplying the time-like variable. So the way I do that is just to define my new time-like variable as dt over a. So that's nice, because now if I say were to draw a space-time diagram, everything light, uh, null geodesics, travel on 45-degree lines because I find null geodesics by setting ds squared equal to zero, and you can see that that implies that d eta equals dx. So this is great. This is every null geodesic that I could ever care about. So imagine I have uh, the following space-time diagram. Here's some world line, and here's the past light cone after some time. Uh, of course, in this model of a Robertson-Walker universe, there is a, a Big Bang. Well, what is the Big Bang? It's not a place, it's a time. It's, it's the time where the scale factor goes to zero. Could you say a word about the meaning of A of T? So it is just basically the expansion between any two points. Yeah, so pick two points. And then this is going to tell you how, how space grows everywhere. Yeah, so in a homogeneous isotropic universe, it expands the same everywhere. <coughs> two points will expand away from each other the same. So, uh, Joel mentioned this, but let's, let's talk a, a little bit more about it. Something called the particle horizon. Okay, this is really, really important in, in understanding the structure of this space-time. So what is the particle horizon? It's basically the distance out to which I can see if I wait a certain amount of time. So of course that, in a universe with a Big Bang, because there's a time limit, right? There's only a finite amount of time going back to the Big Bang, is always going to be a fixed finite size. So I wait long enough, I can see how long I go. Uh, here it's really easy. What is, what is that distance? Well, it's basically just the elapsed conformal time, or the integral of dt over a. And we can rewrite this integral in a rather suggestive form. We can rewrite it as such. So this is d log a over a h. And 1 over a h is something called the co-moving horizon. So h inverse, 1 over h, is usually it's the physical horizon. That's sort of the some scale that's going to tell us about uh, the causal relation between two different points. 
And this concept of the particle horizon makes that precise. So if I have two points that are separated by a distance more than their particle horizon, then it's not possible for any communication to have happened between them, right? They're just totally causally separate. So this co-moving horizon is going to be a, a, a key character in, uh, in analyzing fluctuations in cosmology. So, so just remember that for now. Can you repeat that about the horizon? Would you almost smash a couple paragraphs? Yeah. So the particle horizon is basically how far out I can see at the surface defining the Big Bang. So, you know, what's the farthest distance light could have traveled to me from since the Big Bang? That's the particle horizon. Or, or to put it differently, it's a sphere surrounding <coughs> that radius. Yes. People often like to have that picture in their head. Okay. So when I showed those cosmic spheres of time, that's the outermost sphere. That's right. So, uh, so the equations of motion for the metric in, uh, in a homogeneous universe is just the Friedman equation. So that relates, uh, sorry, that should be a dot over a squared. So it relates uh, Hubble, which is defined as a dot over a, to the density. Okay, and that's the total density. So that would be the sum over all the individual densities and all these different fluids. And then we have the continuity equation, which tells us how basically matter or radiation or these fluids, how they dilute as the universe expands. That's given here. And then I need to supplement that with uh, the equation of state. And the solutions to this two set of coupled equations is here. So uh, rho falls off like some power of A, and A grows like some power of T. And so I guess the important thing to note here is that different fluids will gravitate differently. A universe filled with radiation will expand differently than a universe filled with matter, et cetera, et cetera. And here is uh, the diagram that Joel showed, which shows in our universe how things evolve. So we start with radiation. Here the equation of state parameter is the third. Rho falls off like 1 over e to the fourth. And then matter falls off slightly slower. So eventually matter comes to dominate the energy budget of the universe. And then dark energy doesn't dilute at all, or very slowly. And uh, so eventually that comes to dominate, because it's just a constant energy density. Could, could you bring back the previous slide? I'm moving a little too fast. Uh, so now, the, the solution of these first order equations are the two solutions here, some power of That's correct, yes. Equations. And that works unless W is minus 1, and then A is exponential. Okay, so different fluids dilute differently. That's the take-home point. And here's the evolution of the scale factor. Uh, here we're measuring T in units of the time today. So radiation domination happens in some small little snippet here. You can't even see it on the plot. Uh, and then most of the universe, uh, for most of the age of the universe, uh, things were matter dominated uh, until today things are starting to become dominated by dark energy, and the scale factor is starting this exponential increase. So that's the homogeneous universe. Uh, one final thing, there's, there's a way of writing the Friedman equation, which we've already seen, which is in terms of an energy budget today. Okay, so in a flat universe, the sum of the fractional energy density in all these different fluids today must be 1. And if I want to figure out what h is at an earlier time, I just uh, multiply by the appropriate power of the scale factor. So here is what we think our universe looks like today, based on data from Planck, which we'll get into lecture after next. Uh, mostly dark energy and dark matter, a few you know, little civets of ordinary matter and very little radiation today. Uh, and then you can evolve this to be you know, to figure out the budget at any earlier time by just multiplying by these factors a bit. And some useful numbers to keep in your head. So H0 is kind of a measure of the size and age of the universe. So a uh, convenient number to keep in mind is, is uh, that H0 is 
some little h that's order one is like 0.7 over 3,000 megaparsecs. Okay, what's a megaparsec? Well, that's a convenient unit, a convenient unit in cosmology. Uh, to turn it into something that you might know more about, it's about 10 to the 23 meters. That's not really that helpful. Uh, maybe maybe 10 to the 6 light years is a little bit better. So, um, so that's roughly a characterization of the size of the universe. Multiply that by uh, 1 over c, and you'll get the Okay, so it's also useful to characterize things in terms of redshift. Uh, I screwed up the formula for redshift. That should be lambda mid over lambda mid minus lambda observed. And it's related to the scale factor as follows. And typically, we say that the scale factor today is 1, uh, and the redshift is 0. That's convention. So here's some useful numbers to keep in mind. Uh, so the redshift at the time when matter and radiation are, have equal energy densities is about 3,400. The redshift at the time the CMB forms is about 1,000. When reionization happens, it's about 11. The furthest galaxies are sort of 11 or 12. Uh, if you look at galaxy surveys, they can go out to a redshift of about 1. The redshift when lambda starts to dominate was about 0.28. And the redshift to the closest cluster of galaxies, the, the Virgo cluster, I don't know if it's the closest, but it's one of the biggest, is 0.003. Okay, so these will be online. If you ever want to know anything about you know, like one of these typical redshifts, you can, you can look it up. OK, so that's the homogeneous universe. We don't live in a homogeneous universe because we wouldn't be here. So there's structure of the universe. And that's the interesting part. And a convenient way of thinking about the structure in the universe is to think about structure on different scales. Obviously, there's structure on a lot of different scales. We have uh, you know, coffee cups and the Earth and galaxies and clusters of galaxies. So there's stuff happening on all different scales. The way to think about that is to go to Fourier space. So here is some set of galaxies in some region of space. And we can go to Fourier space. Uh, we can just do the discrete Fourier transform in this box. Okay, here's that. And k equals 0, wave number equals 0, that's, that's, just, uh, that's just sort of the average, right? So that's rho bar. That's the homogeneous universe. And then we can look at, well, let's say I take uh, you know, some long wavelength fluctuations. And I average the density in different galaxies and under densities between the galaxies. I'll get something here, and it's going to be small on really large scales. That's just an empirical fact. It didn't need to be that way, but in our universe, it's, it's relatively small. And then I look at somewhat smaller scales, and well, there's gravity, so galaxies kind of like to cluster a little bit, so it's going to go up. And then on even smaller scales, well, now I'm at the scale, say, of galaxies. And there's a lot of structure on the scale of galaxies. And there's even more structure on smaller scales, the scale of stars, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so that's our universe in, in this scale-dependent picture. And it's going to be really helpful to think about our universe in a scale-dependent way. When I say there's structure in the universe, so what, what is structure? So a definition of structure is just when these deltas these small fluctuations in density on top of the backgrounds are no, are no longer small. So when they become of order in the background density, I'm going to say I have structure. So what is this for different types of structures in cosmology? So for galaxies, this density contrast is about a million. For clusters of galaxies, it's about a thousand. A thousand. For superclusters, it's, it's sort of order one. This is something that's just now being called a structure. It's just forming structure. And this kind of, well, so, you know, what, why is there structure? Because things undergo gravitational collapse. So there's going to be structure on all scales that have had a chance to do so. Um, quick yeah. little footnote, because I mentioned gravitational collapse this morning, and people often, from the, hearing the name gravitational collapse, get the idea that there's really a collapse. But as I said this morning, it's only a factor of two in radius. What happens is the rest of the universe continues to expand. Okay. So things remember the density of the universe at the time they collapse. 
Yeah. That is stopped expand. Collapse means stopped expanding. Yeah. I, I'm only interrupting because I know that that's something that this term collapse confuses people, and they think that it's really collapsed, and it really just means, as far as the dark matter is concerned, it stops expanding. Okay. Fair enough. So these largest scales, superclusters, basically define the scale above which, which fluctuations in density are linear. Anything below these scales, smaller than these scales, are nonlinear. Okay? But what is that scale? It's a wave number between maybe 0.1 and 0.1, 0.01 inverse megaparsecs, which is maybe a percent, or you know, like tenth of a percent of the size of the observable universe. Could you, you yep. say a word about the point? You have a set of differential equations which you pull up your solution. Are these predictions of your solutions? I mean, you get these results from solving the equation, or you're looking at the observation and then fitting things so that the observation and the solutions match? So there are six free parameters in this theory, which, is, which are the, the densities of these different fluids, the most important ones. There's the, the statistics of the fluctuations. And then, and then this uh, optical depth. And everything else follows from solving the equations. So you're saying you're getting galaxy clusters and superclusters by solving the equations? Yes. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Predictive. Yeah. Highly yeah. Yeah. That's everything. Everything you want is those equations I wrote at the beginning. And it's even easier because you just basically need Newtonian gravity to get galaxies and stuff. So you don't need geo. Okay, so, so this defines a scale above which you know, things are, are simple. On smaller scales, they're, they're hard. Okay, so when I say structure, what do I mean? What kind of structure? Well, there's structure in luminous matter, right? So there's, there's baryons and photons. That's all the stuff you see in this picture. And then there's sort of semi-luminous. I'll call it semi-luminous because there's a pair that we can detect them, which are neutrinos. A lot of neutrinos in the universe. Can detect those. And then there's the dark. Uh, so there's dark matter and dark energy. That's kind of living underneath that picture. Can't directly observe it yet. We haven't directly observed it yet. Uh, but you know, maybe, maybe hopefully soon. But I, I don't understand. You only yeah. talked about density uh, and you get the parameters you introduce for density. It never talked about baryons or photons or yeah, so there's different components. So there are different what fluids. What do you mean by all these things? That they're not in your equation. Oh, sure they are. So the density. How are they in your equation? In what, in what parameters? In the densities. So all you need, all these different things are fluids in this approximation. Okay? In, the, in the approximation that these things don't interact, which will not be good in a minute, but for now I'll just take that. Uh, these are different fluids. And they're characterized by some density and an equation of state parameter that tells me how the density is related to pressure. And those densities appear in the equations. Yeah. So that's, that's it. OK, uh, so let's now talk about gravitational collapse maybe in a little bit more detail. <coughs> so if I had non-relativistic matter in flat space, then here is everything I need to describe fluids and gravity. So there's the continuity equation. Okay, that's basically part of that nabla mu t mu nu. There's the Euler equation, which is like Newton's second law. And then there's Poisson equation, which tells me how uh, a density gravitates. Okay, so this is, this is just uh, Newton's law of gravity. So now we do this trick of looking at linear fluctuations. So we have some background density, some background gravitational potential, some background velocities. And then I have a pressure. So here I'm going to trade the speed of sound uh, with the density, with the equation of state. And they're related as follows because the speed of sound is just the the partial derivative of pressure with respect to density and constant entropy. So this is just W. <clears throat> so the, the linear part is easy. Okay, so by linearize, uh, I mean take these terms. So like here I've got a rho V, here I've got a V V, here I've got a del P over rho. Okay? And I want to take these 
substitute in these, and then only keep things that are linear in the deltas. So anything that has a delta squared, chuck it out. It's second order. Okay? It's not going to be important as long as delta is small. So we take these equations and we quote linearize them. That just means chuck out anything that has a delta squared in it, or higher order. And you can combine them into this really simple partial differential equation, okay, where everything has to do with the density. And you can see here that the speed of sound appears. And if I want to find phi, then I can just back up and stick that density in and solve for phi. So. OK, so that's the equation of motion. Pretty easy. And now uh, we can make it even easier by Fourier transforming. So this is a linear equation in delta rho. So this is a great opportunity to uh, go to Fourier space because the Fourier modes don't couple. So here's the Fourier transform, my conventions. And if I stick that in to that equation of motion, then I'll get an ordinary differential equation, right? So I've got here the part that depends on k. And then here is that 4 pi g times the background density. And this is a really easy equation to solve, right? It's just the harmonic oscillator. So the general solution is given by some sines and cosines. Here it's more convenient to write it as, as exponentials. And omega, this uh, frequency, is k squared times the speed of sound squared minus 4 pi g rho bar. So there's two components, right? Now, if this is, uh, if, if k squared cs squared is bigger than 4 pi g rho, then this is a real number and these are oscillatory. But if this term is bigger than that term, this is imaginary. And then those exponentials are exponentially growing and exponentially decaying solutions. And that defines a scale for us, okay? So the gene scale tells us about this competition between pressure, which is the speed of sound, and gravity, which is the other term there that we have. And so the scale k at which these things are equal, I can turn that into a wavelength, that's just here, is given by this. Okay? So on scales larger than the gene scale, I get exponential growth of fluctuations. On scales smaller than the gene scale, I get oscillatory motion. So here's the distinction. On small scales, I have basically what are sound waves. Okay? On big scales, I have what I call here gravitational collapse. By gravitational collapse, I just mean the exponential growth of these four A modes. Okay? So that's gravitational collapse. So I look at these different scales, and each scale undergoes a slightly different evolution, and some of them grow, some of them oscillate. Okay, so that was in flat space with you know, no GR or anything. So let's do a slightly more complicated thing, which is to look in an expanding universe. So in an expanding universe, uh, waves stretch, right? So if I had here a constant co-moving distance, that corresponds to a growing physical distance. So some wave, in terms of co-moving coordinates, and physical coordinates actually looks like an expanding wave. And physical scales are related by a factor of the scale factor to, to co-moving scales. That's just the stretching of space, the expansion of the universe. So only gravitationally bound, that is non-linear, or when delta rho over rho is bigger than 1, structures can separate from this tendency to expand. That tendency to expand is some called, sometimes called the Hubble flow. Okay, so everything wants to expand with the universe. That's the Hubble flow. <coughs> and another thing that you might have guessed is that well, expansion probably inhibits collapse, because you're, you're taking this region which has a, you know, some collection of density, and you're smearing it out, right? So, you know, okay, well, do we care about, about the expansion of the universe? Well, we can define some characteristic time scale for collapse. That's basically the, the 
thing that appeared in the exponential for really large scales. That, that would be the, the e folding time or the time it takes that exponential to grow. And that was 4, by, 4 pi g rho bar inverse. And that is about of order Hubble. Okay, so that's a cosmological time scale that it takes for things to collapse. So yeah, expansion is going to be relevant. You should care about that. So including expansion on small enough scales uh, gives you this equation of motion. It follows from the same laws that I wrote before, but now the coordinates are expanding. Okay, so I'm living in an expanding universe, but I've still got the sort of Euler equation, continuity equation, and then Poisson equation. So here you see uh, is where the expansion of the universe comes in. It gives me this extra term. And that's going to influence how these fluctuations grow. It kind of damps the growth of, uh, it damps the, the collapse of structure. So let's look at a particular example. Let's just get rid of that piece, the sound speed. So, so set the sound speed to zero. That's like if I had a fluid with no pressure, that's like dark matter, say. Okay, that's pretty relevant. So fluctuations in dark matter grow differently depending on how the universe is expanding. During radiation domination, oh, I screwed that up. During radiation domination, they grow like log A. So, so please insert there. <laughs> during matter domination, they grow like A. And during dark energy domination, they, they're just constant. They don't grow at all. So, uh, so please take this and put it here, because during matter domination, it grows like a scale factor. During radiation, it, it grows like the log of the scale factor. Actually, I, I explained that in uh, my last lecture. Uh -huh. So, in, in the historical way. Right. Right. Okay. So we 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 already learned something very interesting here. Okay. So nothing happens during radiation domination. And structure formation turns off as soon as the dark energy starts to dominate. So in order to have structure, you need a large enough initial set of density perturbations when matter starts to dominate. It can only grow as much as the scale factor grows between radiation between matter radiation equality and, and the time dark energy comes to dominate. And the scale factor only grows by roughly a factor of a thousand during that time, 1,000 or 10,000. <coughs> Excuse me. So that means you need an initial set of density perturbations that have an amplitude at least bigger than about 3 times 10 to the minus 4. Otherwise, we wouldn't have galaxies or, or any structure. That would be it. So incidentally, you can see part of this argument uh, about the cosmological constant problem here as well. So if dark energy dominated far earlier in the history of the universe, then you also wouldn't get nonlinear structure unless you made that initial perturbation really big. So you've got this finite window of time uh, between when radiation and dark energy dominate that you can grow structure. That's it. At other times in the universe, you don't grow structure. OK, so let's go back to this important scale that I told you about. There is, uh, which was this co-moving horizon. So there's an epoch known as, as, quote, horizon crossing. That's when k equals a h. Okay? And you can think of this as when the peaks and troughs of a given Fourier mode can, can communicate. If the wavelength is within the co-moving horizon, they can. If it's out of the co-moving horizon, they can't. They're just causally separate. And any given k mode, here I have a plot of co-moving scale versus conformal time. So these are co-moving scales, so they just stay constant in any given k-mode. But this co-moving horizon is evolving in time. And during radiation or matter domination, it's basically growing linearly in time. Okay. So that means that for any given k, there is some time at which it will, quote, cross the horizon. <clears throat> and because in a matter or radiation-dominated universe, the co-moving horizon is always growing. For any given k-mode, if I go far enough back in time, 
it's always going to be super, quote, super horizon. That is, it's going to have a wavelength that's bigger than the scale of the horizon. For different k's, that happens at different times, but for any k, it's true. So this simplistic picture I've shown you of gravitational collapse needs to get modified a little bit when we talk about things that happen above the scale defined by the horizon, this horizon crossing scale. So for, for things that have a wavelength larger than that scale, GR actually becomes important. So I need to care about GR corrections. Uh, and what you'll find is that above this scale, well, there's just basically by causality no, no gravitational collapse at all. And we'll see a little bit later that things tend to just stay constant or, quote, freeze in on such scales. And then at smaller scales, you can have gravitational collapse and, and the story I told you before holds. So another thing you can learn just from this picture is that smaller scales collapse first. Right? So the co-moving horizon is always growing. And smaller scales are going to enter the co-moving horizon sooner, and they're going to have a longer time to collapse. So smaller scales will undergo collapse first. Okay, I've mentioned this before, so extrapolating all scales starts super horizon at some point. And that introduces a puzzle. So we can ask, uh, you know, these perturbations were made somewhere, or there's some initial conditions that set them up. So where were they made, or where were these initial conditions defined? So perhaps they were produced on sub-horizon scales. Well, that's nice because it's sort of causal. You know, I can imagine doing something that would create these fluctuations on sub-horizon scales. But such, fluctu such conditions are, are in fact ruled out by the data. So these would be something like topological defects, or maybe I have some lumps of stuff around from earlier in the universe, and those generated the density fluctuations. Turns out that's completely inconsistent with what we see. <coughs> or, my other alternative is to generate the perturbations here on superhorizon scales. And from everything that I've told you so far, well, that's a little bit nasty because it's acausal. I have to set up correlations outside of the particle horizon of two different points. So what would do that? However, that agrees with what we see. So that, that, that in fact, will give you a, a nice set of initial conditions that will evolve into everything that we see today. And of course, the idea behind that, just one second, is uh, inflation. So we'll see that inflation fixes this problem with, with causality. Uh, question. Could you say a little bit more about the data that's backing you this up? You say ruled out by data, agrees with data. So uh, the CMB, Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation, um, surveys of galaxies, galaxy clusters, uh, yeah. But, but in that, that uh, thing that I've now shown a couple of times with all the wiggles, yes. and similarly with the polarization, uh, that cannot be produced by any causal process. Yes, that is right. That is right. So you've seen the data. I, yeah, I just didn't say that extra part, which Matt's now going to explain. Yeah. OK, so how does inflation fix this problem? It basically makes a shrinking co-moving horizon. So that now you can have an earlier time when perturbations were sub-horizon. So you don't need these acausal correlations. They can, they can be causal. Of course, we'll talk about that in a lot greater detail tomorrow. OK, so that was, that was the simplistic model. And I told you that really what you need is general relativity. We won't go into all the details, but I'll just go through a quick outline. So in the full model, here were the main players I flashed on that first slide. And here are the, the laws that I need to solve for, uh, for these fluctuations. And another nice feature of linear theory is that gravity becomes rather simple. So Anthony told you that there were a total of 10 independent metric degrees of, well, 10, 10 metric degrees of freedom. They're not all independent. <coughs> and in linear theory, you can split them up. So there's four scalars. These are things that source density fluctuations. These are the interesting ones for cosmology. There's uh, four vector degrees of freedom. These decay. They're not major players. And then there's two tensor ones. Those are gravitational waves. 
So this is a property of linear theory. Uh, at the nonlinear level, all this stuff mixes up into some crazy mess, and, and, and it's nasty. So that's, that's a good thing. And because I have the freedom to choose four coordinates, there's four coordinate choices I can make. Or said in a different way, there's a Bianchi identity that gives me four constraint equations. <clears throat> there's only really six degrees of freedom buried in here. And I have a lot of freedom to choose where I put these different degrees of freedom. But I always have to have six. These are gauge invariants, so I, I always have to have two. Uh, but these guys you can, you can mix up a little bit. Uh, so when you do general relativity, any coordinate choice is good. You, you can make any coordinate choice you like. Uh, but you need to make a choice. So that's called fixing a gauge. Okay, so that's making a gauge choice, choosing a set of coordinates. And one popular set of coordinates, which you've already seen today, is this so-called Newtonian gauge. Okay, so this is the, the metric in the conformal Newtonian gauge, where I've only shown you the scalar part, and there's two scalar degrees of freedom in this gauge. I've gotten rid of the rest of them by my coordinate definitions. And that's one consistent choice. There are tons of consistent choices. Uh, it's really confusing to go back and forth between all these choices, and you should be careful when reading the literature, literature et cetera, et cetera. But you know, if you make a choice and you go with it, you're good. There's also so-called gauge invariant observables that don't depend on this choice of coordinates. <clears throat> but I won't talk about those today. OK, so, uh, so that's pretty much everything I think I have to say about, about the general picture, the laws, what kind of equations you need to solve. Uh, so now let's step back and, and look at some important events in the history of the universe, and finally we'll get to talk about the CMB. So there's matter radiation equality, okay? And around this time, there are two important things to know. The first is that the universe is a plasma. Okay? Photons like to interact with charged particles, so that means that all the photons in the universe and all the electrons and protons form this really tightly coupled fluid. Okay, so you can think of them as one fluid. You know, any time a baryon moves, it's going to kick a photon, and that's just going to go right with it. So I can't make a lump of baryons with also have, without also having a lump of photons. <clears throat> so this fluid has a sound speed of about half, half the speed of, well, whatever square root two of the speed of light. It's about half. CS squared is about a half. Okay, um, so the baryons by themselves, if they were neutral, they don't really have any pressure. The photons have a lot of pressure. So this is some compromise between a fluid that has absolutely no pressure and one that, that has a lot. <clears throat> so also around this time, because we're in matter radiation equality, matter starts to dominate, and therefore these dark matter perturbations can begin to grow. So those are two significant things. And then we have recombination. Recombination is when the universe cools sufficiently that the electrons and protons can combine to form neutral hydrogen. So neutral atoms form, and now uh, this coupled fluid just separates into two fluids. I now have baryons, which don't interact with photons, because now all the electrons and protons are just neutral hydrogen, and photons don't interact very often with neutral hydrogen. <clears throat> so that is the CMB, right? You have all of this radiation digging around inside of these electrons and protons, and then all of a sudden it's free to travel. Okay? This, this, this fluid breaks up into two separate fluids. And now these baryons no longer have any pressure. So now you can actually form luminous matter. You can get galaxies and interesting stuff like that. Uh, so baryons can now collapse into these gravitational potential wells formed by the dark matter halos, and you can get structure growth of luminous matter. And the next interesting thing, uh, from the perspective of the CMB, there's all sorts of other interesting things in the history of the universe, but this is biased, is uh, reionization. So when the first stars form, they release an, an enormous amount of ultraviolet radiation. And what that does is it takes all the, all the neutral hydrogen in the interstellar media, intergalactic medium, and it, and it ionizes it again. So that's a, an event known as reionization. 
around this time, the first nonlinear structure is forming. That's what caused this to happen. So that's the first stars forming. We get the hierarchical structure formation of smaller blobs into bigger blobs, which I imagine Joel will tell you all about tomorrow. And then uh, some CMB photons rescatter off of all of these, uh, these uh, now electrons and protons that fill the universe. So baryon acoustic oscillations were mentioned. Let's just say a word about that. So as I said, before recombination, photons and baryons couple. So here's this simple equation describing how perturbations evolve uh, in some fluid. And here's the sound speed. That's, that's the thing that I'm getting from this effective coupling between the photons and uh, the baryons. And I can solve this equation. Okay, the this, this solution is just sines and cosines on small enough scales. And the frequency is given by a particularly significant scale. This is something called the sound horizon. It's basically how far, it's the particle horizon for sound waves. Okay, so it's how far sound waves can propagate before recombination. So this, as Joel said, is a standard ruler. It's a, it's a length scale. And it's a length scale that's basically determined by how much the universe expanded, or how it expanded. Okay, so this actually gives us a handle on what the stuff of the universe is, how much matter and radiation there was. And it's like a game of musical chairs. So I have all these different modes, and they have different wavelengths, and they oscillate at different frequencies. And so when recombination happens, well, some of them don't have any chairs, okay? So they end up with zero amplitude. And some of them happen to have the right frequency that they have a, a large amplitude, okay? And so this gives me a set of peaks, right? Because now I've got, so these, these these photons and baryons, now they decouple and the photons just run away. And I'm left with baryons that have uh, a distribution with, with, with these uh, wavelengths, okay? And, and then nothing here. So I get these peaks, uh, and these peaks occur at wave numbers that are related to this sound horizon, okay? Related to the frequency of, of these oscillations. And that's the baryon acoustic oscillation. So uh, there are maxima in the density of both of these baryons and the photons, because they're, they're all up. <clears throat> okay, so what about those photons? So the universe, as you've heard, is filled with a gas of photons. That's what we call the CMB. How do we characterize a gas of photons in a totally homogeneous universe? You characterize it, say, by the, the number that I have in a unit of phase space. Okay, so that, here, F, tells me how many there are per unit phase space volume. And that is the distribution function. Of course, you've probably all seen uh, the distribution function for, for bosons, like photons. That's just the Bose-Einstein distribution. Okay, so here it is. And of course, T, the temperature, is now a function of time because the universe is expanding. As the universe expands, all these momenta are stretched with the expansion of the universe. And so this, this temperature, the Bose-Einstein distribution, gets stretched, right? So this is why the, the, you know, the CMB is the universe's most uh, perfect black body. I, I basically set up thermal equilibrium with all these photons. And then they interact with absolutely nothing and stretch as the universe expands. So they always follow this Bose-Einstein distribution. It's just that the temperature decreases. And the temperature of the CMB today uh, is about 3 degrees Kelvin. Okay. And that's where we are. OK, so the CMB is not totally uniform. Otherwise, you wouldn't have ever heard about Planck or WMAP or all these interesting experiments that tell us wonderful things about the universe. Uh, <clears throat> there are perturbations. There are fluctuations. And so I can characterize them as fluctuations inside of this distribution function, basically fluctuations in the temperature. So this thing theta is delta t over t. So it's, it's the change in temperature uh, over the background temperature overall. So observers at different positions will see some anisotropic distribution of photons. How would I calculate that formally? What I want to know is how many are there here and now? 
Okay, so this dn, the number that I see in the unit phase space, is a function of where I am. So to get that, I would just integrate this phase space distribution with a delta function telling me what is it here. Okay, what is the value of this distribution function here? And that will depend on where I look on the sky. There's going to be some dependence on direction. This is anisotropic. And that's the CMB, the anisotropies in the CMB. So how would you find that? Well, here is the full set of coupled variables that you'd need. So here is the dark matter, uh, the density and velocity. Here's the baryons, the density and the velocity. There's the photons, and there's the metric. Same as before, just cast into these variables. <clears throat> and this delta t over t, at least on the largest scales, can be determined by a very simple formula. So, how could the photons have a different temperature? Well, they might have a different intrinsic temperature at the time the CMB was formed. That's one piece. And then, because they're evolving in this metric, there's going to be some extra gravitational redshift on top of just the overall stretching in the background universe. Okay, so we have an intrinsic temperature minus this gravitational potential. Uh, giving us what we observe for delta C over T. And this is something called the Sachs-Wolf formula. And it turns out when you evolve that coupled set of equations and evaluate this, you'll find that delta T over T is negative uh, times this gravitational potential over 3. And so what that means is that the gravitational redshift is actually more important than this intrinsic uh, variation in the temperature. That's kind of cool. That's just how it is. And then there's something else called the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect that, that's basically the time dependence of the gravitational potentials. So if the gravitational potentials evolve in time, they can add energy or suck energy from photons uh, because they have to climb into an evolving stretching potential, potential well or a collapsing one. Okay, uh, so in linear theory, it's kind of nice because we can take these intrinsic variations in the uh, temperature and the gravitational potential for each different Fourier mode and ask what they do to the CMB, and then add them up. So here is the CMB on some spatial slice, okay? and I'm looking at it. So of course, when I look out, as Joel mentioned, we have a set of nested celestial spheres, right? So I have a sky. And that sky for the CMB is basically the projection of my past light cone onto this surface when the CMB was formed. So that Fourier mode actually maps onto a set of fluctuations that I would see in the temperature on my sky. And here's what it would look like for this particular Fourier mode. And of course I have many Fourier modes, so here is what it would look like in general. This is just the sum of all the different Fourier modes for the density, say. And then I would map that onto my CMB sky. I'd map that onto this, this celestial sphere. But it's nice, because in linear theory, I can do that on a mode by mode basis. So I have this set of fluctuations on my CMB sky. And a convenient way of characterizing them is, again, to go to harmonic space. But now it's not Fourier space, it's to, to transform into spherical harmonics. So I take this distribution of temperatures, and then I perform the spherical harmonic transform. <clears throat> and there's an object called the transfer function, which will take this potential, which is a function of k, that's the thing that depends on space, on the surface of last scattering. And it will turn it into these spherical harmonic coefficients, which tell me how the temperature is mapped onto the sphere. So just going back, this kernel, this operator, basically takes this, and it performs this mapping for me. Okay, So it will tell me all of the spherical harmonic coefficients that I need on the sphere. You can calculate that analytically in a number of regimes, but in practice what people do is to stick this into some standard publicly available code 
and turn some initial set of density fluctuations into uh, these ALMs. So for instance, CAM, CMB fast, there's like 10 now, I think. And these fluctuations, well, you don't really want to know like every single possible set of ALMs, right? You want to know something statistical, some coarse-grained information about these fluctuations. <coughs> So, in this plane, at, you know, at the time the CMB was formed, how would I characterize the fluctuations in the gravitational potential, which tell me delta t over t? Well, you'd calculate correlation functions between different k-modes. So these correlation functions give me something known as the power spectrum. So these correlation functions you can think of are like moments of a probability distribution for getting different Fourier coefficients. And they're Gaussian if, say, the three-point function, the odd-point functions are zero, and the even-point functions are just powers of, of, of the two-point function. So this gets mapped into a set of statistics for the spherical harmonic coefficients. And there, the relevant thing is the angular power spectrum, CL. CL is related to what I have, the prediction from theory, which is P of K, Again, by this transfer function. Okay. So here's the transfer function there. And that you can just think of as some black box that relates the statistics of primordial fluctuations in the density and photons and whatever to the statistics of the fluctuations we actually see in the CMB. It's just a black box. Okay, so here's the data. So P of K, I promised you in the beginning that I had a six-parameter model which had two parameters characterizing the statistical fluctuations. One of them is an amplitude and the other is a tilt, a so-called tilt, that's an S. We'll talk more about that tomorrow, but, but here it is for now. And that gets mapped through the transfer function onto these CLs. So here's the data. Um, so on the vertical axis here, we have the, the amplitude of the power, the amplitude of the temperature fluctuations. And on the horizontal scale, we have angular scale or multiple moment, as you wish. So small multiple moments mean large angular scales and, and vice versa. So there's a few uh, things to note about, about this power spectrum. So first of all, if we look at these largest scales, now remember I told you that the smallest scales collapse first. So the largest scales haven't collapsed. In fact, the largest scales are of order the size of the observable universe. <clears throat> so you'll note here that the power in these largest scales of order the size of the observable universe is not zero. It's actually flat, some flat plateau. You, you see that from the maths up here because the power spectrum doesn't go to zero for k goes to, to zero. So, <clears throat> so this is, is where that formula that I showed you for delta t over t is, is most valid. That's the Sachs-Wolf plateau. And this tells us a lot about the primordial perturbations, right? Because these haven't really had a chance to evolve. They haven't collapsed yet. They're still part of the linear universe today. And the most striking feature of this data are these peaks. And these are the acoustic peaks that are due to the fact that we had these baryon acoustic oscillations. So in that game of musical chairs, these are the scales that are, uh, well, this is some combination of the scales, I guess, because these CLs are some combination of different K-modes. But, but these are the combination of K-modes that, that, that were maximum at the time the CMB was formed. Okay? So these are the, the preferred scales uh, where I had more photons because of these baryon acoustic oscillations. <coughs> and you'll notice that they, they're, they're, there's some structure here. So, so you know the first, first peak is really high, and then, and then there's some relative difference between the second and third peak. <coughs> and these relative differences tell me how much dark matter dark energy, whether or not the universe is curved or flat, all of this information is in these acoustic peaks. 
And how it is in these acoustic peaks comes through that sound horizon. Because sound will travel a different distance depending on how the universe expanded. So, so that preferred scale is imprinted on these acoustic peaks, and it tells me a lot about what the universe is made of. We'll, we'll talk more about that um, in the third lecture. Uh, the fitting curve, the is that based on the six parameters alone, or are there additional no. parameters that go into fitting this curve? No, that's the six parameter fit. Yeah, so this is the best fit given those six parameters. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Well, you need this fit. Yeah. That's right. And you get all those other curves, too. Yeah. So, yeah. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Um, so, yeah, just the six parameters, that's the best fit. We'll talk more about that, by the way, on, 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 on the third lecture. I just want to give you a flavor right now. So, so the other feature here is this uh, so-called damping tail. So you'll notice the power just goes down with, 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 with smaller and smaller angular scales. And that's because if I look in the early universe, uh, on the surface, if I go to small enough scales, it's really easy for photons to move around and sort of erase the temperature differences. There's enough time there for, for them to do that. So that's just sort of a smearing out because photons can travel some, some significant distance. Okay, <clears throat> okay so, so, so I mean, that's, that's basically it, right? So, you should be able to understand now the basic features of the CMB and so why, why there are these peaks and why is there still power on these arbitrarily large scales. And that's kind of the most interesting stuff. Yeah, I wish there was more interesting stuff in the CMB, but, but it appears that the six parameter model works really darn well. So pretty much you understand all you need to understand about cosmology. Well, let's make some comments of why. Uh, and then we'll talk about some other cool stuff we can do with the CMB. So the first comment is that in a statistically homogeneous and isotropic universe with Gaussian fluctuations, the power spectrum is all the information that there is. That's it. Okay, so once you measure the power spectrum, you're done. You can try measuring other stuff, but if it really is that, then you will never find anything. Ever. That's all the information there is. And that's the definition of Gaussian fluctuation. Yes. But it's an amazing compression no, no, yeah, of information. But, but people have yeah. to understand that Gaussian, saying it's Gaussian is saying a lot. Right. Yeah, that's absolutely saying a lot. And just think, it's an amazing, uh, it's just such an amazing compression of information, right? Like two numbers and that tells you everything about the statistics. It's pretty cool. Uh, so I mentioned this, that there's powers on scales the size of the observable universe. And those are really super horizon fluctuations. And we're going to talk more about that tomorrow. That really motivates it. It's another motivation for this idea of, well, that, that is the motivation for this idea of inflation, basically. Um, and then the structure of these acoustic peaks, as I said, is determined by the contents of the universe as well as the initial conditions. So that tells us a lot. OK, other cool things in the CMD. So uh, for the first time, Planck. Well, there was a, a measurement of lensing of the CMB, but it was not as good. So the first time this was really measured accurately was with Planck. So the, here's the CMB, and here's all this interesting structure in the universe. And in order to get to us, photons have to travel through all of this interesting structure. And photons get gravitationally lensed. They, they are gravitationally attracted to matter, just like everything else. And so by measuring the lensing of the CMB, you can actually get a lot of information about the, the intervening structure. So one of the significant developments that we'll talk about in lecture three with Planck is, is, is that, that this independent measurement of lensing actually gives you a lot of information. So this is really a nice thing that people can do now. Another cool thing in the CMB is that it is polarized. Why is it polarized? Uh, just like sunlight reflecting off of a pond of water, when CMB scatters, uh, a CMB photon scatters off of an electron, it becomes polarized. So there's going to be a correlation between the density of electrons and the polarization. So when it's more dense, you're going to get photons that are you know, colliding more often, and therefore there's going to be a larger polarization signal. <clears throat> and 
different types of perturbations produce different types of polarization. Now it turns out that you can think of polarization, you know, you can decompose it in much the same way that you decompose uh, uh, vector fields. So, well, it is a vector field, so it's kind of obvious. So, so in E and M, you can have uh, you know, the electric field and the magnetic field. And uh, the magnetic field has curl, but it is divergenceless. And the electric field has divergence, but it's curlless. And similarly, you can define uh, polarization states that are E-type and B-type modes. So they either have no curl or they, they have a curl. And it turns out that the only way to source these so-called B-mode polarization uh, is through primordial gravitational waves. So you need some tensor fluctuations living in the universe, and, and these are not the gravitational waves of frequencies produced by colliding black holes or anything astrophysical. These are gravitational waves the size of the observable universe. And small. And small, but those you don't see so much. <laughs> the ones we hope to detect are the ones that are basically the size of the observable universe. So uh, we haven't seen this yet. It's something that people are looking for. but. Hopefully, we should have a lot more to say about that from cosmology in the next few years. There's the Sunyak Zeldovich effect. That's basically shadow, shadows of galaxy clusters in the CMB. So, if there's a galaxy cluster here, it's full of hot gas. And as the CMB photons come through that cloud of hot gas, there are frequency changes. Okay? So, there's a shadow. And by measuring these shadows, you can get an idea of the size, density, number of galaxy clusters. So that's an independent measurement of large scale structure, and it's an independent measure of cosmology. So, that, so that's kind of a nice thing you can do with the CMB. Another pretty cool thing you can do with the CMB is to constrain the combined mass and number of neutrinos. So the universe expands a little bit differently, and structure grows a little bit differently. Well, you have extra relativistic degrees of freedom, like photons. Neutrinos don't clump, just like photons don't clump. And neutrinos can erase structure. <clears throat> so by measuring those peaks in the CMB and that damping, and by measuring, say, uh, well, uh, large-scale structure, like structure of galaxies, you can get uh, constraints on, on neutrinos. That's kind of cool from cosmology. In fact, these constraints are much better than any constraints you can get from laboratory experiments, particle particle physics experiments. So that's pretty cool. OK, so, so that's what you can do with the CMB. Last thing I want to show you is just to impress you with the precision of modern cosmology. It's really a precision science now. So here is a table from Planck. Here are the six parameters of lambda CDM. And uh, just look at the error bars. So enough said. It's really percent level precision or better on most of these parameters. And that's the power of modern cosmology. We're really able to say precise things, I mean very precise things, about, uh, about the, the evolution and structure of the universe. So I guess that's pretty much all I have for today. So tomorrow uh, we're going to rewind to the first slide where I ask this question, why is the universe look like this? Why is the universe almost linear? Why is it basically homogeneous and isotropic? And where do these density fluctuations come from? And uh, the answer I'll give you tomorrow, one answer is that it came from this theory called cosmic inflation. So I'll describe what that is and, and how that came about. But it looks like we have time for questions, so why don't I say something? about so the big picture things you addressed at the very beginning. Uh, you said that among the ingredients uh, you had to, to take into account, one was um, uh, statistical reasoning and the assumption that our universe was typical. And I was wondering um, at what point that plays out in all you, you presented. Um, so one point when, when you explicitly had a statistical consideration was in finding out um, the, the oscillations in the, uh, in the CMB, and I was wondering if there you do have to assume that our universe is typical, or 
if you have to assume that for other calculations and what, what it means in, in what you presented. Absolutely. So, so these laws, so, so I can just solve that for any particular configuration. <clears throat> Um, I, could, I could take what we observed today, the exact position of all the galaxies and everything, and like evolve that back in time and ask what was the actual state of the universe at some early time. Um, that's really hard. Why would I do that? So what I want to do is compress all the information in some meaningful way. So the way to do that is to talk about these fluctuations, not the actual realization of these fluctuations in our universe, but you know, the statistical distribution of these fluctuations. So. Um, so what I, you know, another nice feature of this linear universe, I should say, is that if I just solve how every mode evolves, right, then I can know how that probability distribution will change in time. So I don't need to know, you know, every, since I know how every Fourier mode evolves, then I need to multiply it by some appropriate coefficient, and then I know any configuration you want, okay? Um, so where it comes in, well, it comes in because the thing that we actually know, the thing that we actually measure, uh, is this. So I could show you a picture of the CMB and you'd learn nothing, right? That's the actual realization with all the hot and cold spots. But okay, well, what, what can I extract from that? Nothing. Um, but, but here is the real information, right? So the real information is in the statistics of these fluctuations. And as I said, um, if you know the fluctuations themselves are really statistically homogeneous and isotropic and Gaussian, then, then that's everything. Like you've compressed all the information in those fluctuations into that one graph, and that's it. Um, and that's again, I should say, a blessing of the linear universe, because in a highly nonlinear universe, well, what does nonlinear mean? It means that all these different Fourier modes couple, and so you'd have to make many more plot. I mean, then really all the, then, then it wouldn't be, you wouldn't know how to compress that information in general. And, uh, you know, you, you just sort of like stare at this picture and you know, I don't know how you proceed, honestly. It would be really hard. So the statistics are everything. I mean, that, that's everything we know about the structure in the universe is statistical information. That's really the meaningful information. And now you, you mentioned typicality. Well, in order to compare the predictions with what we observe, we sort of have to assume that what we see there is a random draw, you know, like a typical draw from that probability distribution, not some weird, weird draw. And that comes back to Joel's comments about Stephen Hawking's initials in the CMB, right? I mean, uh, you really need to be careful about, about, um, about statements such as this, right? I have some characterization of the fluctuations, and then I'm assuming it's a typical draw. Why does Stephen Hawking's initials look weird in the CMB? Because that wouldn't be a typical draw from that particular probability distribution. But you know, if I had a theory that predicted Stephen Hawking's initials in the CMB, then it would be a typical draw from the right probability distribution. So those assumptions are in there. Yeah? Actually, just a follow up on the uh, last question. I, I think what the questioner might have been wondering about was so in order to compare in, in order to compare what you see with the predictions of your theory, even if you're granting that, that you're taking a random draw and so on and so forth in, in collecting the evidence, um, the the like you said, you don't want to, you don't want to take the exact microstate of the world now and evolve it back. That's too complicated. In order to get statistical predictions, you need to have some measure over, over the exact microscopic trajectories or, or the exact initial conditions. Mm -hmm. I think the question might have been about where that measure is coming from. Mm -hmm. so, Actually, just to tighten it, uh, I was asked and explained a little bit about the very largest modes, in other words, the low L, mm -hmm. and uh, talked about cosmic variance. Mm -hmm. And of course, the idea is that we only have uh, a few numbers that we can measure. Right. For L equals two, we've got five numbers: the the A L Ms for minus two to the plus two. That's it. Right. And for high L, of course, you have zillions that you can measure. And so, 
the statistical fluctuations are much smaller. Mm -hmm. But when you only have a few, then the noise is big. Right. Right, but that's, we're willing to grant, that's not what the question is about. So the, the measure, where does the measure come from? Um, well, but basically what we're assuming is that this random statistics, what's on? Random with respect to what measure? You, you put a measure over the space of solutions to the Einstein equation. And, and is there a unique such measure? If it yeah. isn't, what, how, how, do you, you know, how do you pick the right one? Right. Blah, blah, blah. So, um, so like I was hinting at, um, if I just have linear fluctuations, then, then yes, I think there is a way to classify the possible perturbations, right? Which is just the and Fourier mean, coefficients. There's a, there's only and a, then there's, there's a... There's a unique mathematically consistent measure of a solution for the unfinite At the linear level, it's just the Fourier coefficients, right? So if I tell you every... I mean, that's the, that, that, that tells you every possible configuration you'd ever care about. It's sure, but then there's still the question of putting a probability... Yeah, so I'm getting there. So, so, that, so that's the classification. And right. then you need to know the probability distribution right. for those Fourier coefficients. Right. And, well, I haven't told you where those come from yet, right? Uh, we think those come from inflation. So we think that the right probability distribution is the probability distribution for quantum fluctuations in the density and the metric and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so where do those come from? Those come from quantum field theory. Uh, is that right? Well, okay, it seems to give us what we see, uh, but but I think there's you know it's an open question if that's the only way of doing that. I but don't think that's unique. Th there's some level which I still don't get. It. Okay. There's there's take the take the uh, take your numbers for probability of acting fluctuations from quantum field theory. Mm -hmm. That's still going to yield. Um, um, you, you, there's still going to be a dependence on what the initial state was or what the probability distribution over the exact initial quantum microstate was. Okay. okay. Where are those coming from? Uh, well, um, you basically <coughs> put in an initial state, which right. is that the, the you know, quantum fields are in the vacuum right. at some initial time. Good. Good. So that is a prescription, Good. that's an input, uh, that's an initial condition, Good. and that's, I guess, outside of, you know, outside and of that's, the And that's walls. an exact microstate, the, the vacuum state. Is that that's right? right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. But, but in field theory, remember that even if you know the exact microstate, sure. you know it's in the vacuum, right. that corresponds to many realizations of actual fluctuations in the field. So if I were to, you know, like, Take a box of Higgs boson. <laughs> this right. doesn't make any sense necessarily. Take a box of Higgs boson and ask what is the value of the field at all the different points in the box. No, no, no. That yeah. state, that, that state simply is a denying state of, right. the local, of the local field values. Okay. Yeah. But it's a perfectly definite. It's a perfectly definite ray in the Hilbert space. Basically. Yeah. Um, it's a single ray. Yeah. So, so you're thinking about actually specifying completely. An initial microstate of the world. Yeah. Okay. Good. That's the input. That's the standard law of inflation. Good. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'm puzzled by one of the very last sentence when you said that's all the information there is, and I do you qualify that or? Uh, yeah. I mean, well, th that's it, right? <laughs> That's well, all that's the answer that there is. Gaussian. Yeah, so that's assuming. So that's that's a testable uh, right. hypothesis. Right. So under these assumptions, you know, any random field that's Gaussian and you know if it's really statistically homogeneous and isotropic, mm -hmm. um, then then you can generate that random field using only this. So, so think about it in the reverse. Like imagine I wanted to simulate this thing, right? How much information would I need? I mean, that's, what, that's all the information you need right there. So I need to take random draws from the probability distribution for each of these L's that had that variance, Gaussian probability distribution, and, and I can simulate that. With random phases. Yeah. 
Anything that isn't specified is completely random. That, that's what Gaussian means. Can you say a little more about this initial condition? Because I'm trying to picture in my head what's going on. I'm a bit confused. I, I would have thought the vacuum is an energy eigenstate and therefore unchanging. Right. So that's one thing I'm confused about. And secondly, like this uh, Higgs potential, I imagine the Mexican hat potential kind of thing that they talk about all the time. And the, the value of the field is with expectation value is supposed to start in your zero near the, the top of the hill and then roll down uh, to one side to, as our universe evolves. And it seems like starting near the top of the hill there is not starting in the vacuum state. Uh, maybe you're wrong. So if you can go ahead, are all the fields in the vacuum, or just some of them in the vacuum state? Yeah, so, uh, so this comes back to this, essentially. Okay, so there's a background and then there's fluctuations. So what, what I would do is fix the background, that is, put the Higgs field wherever you want, or the infantile field wherever you want. And then I would look at fluctuations around that fixed background. Okay? So uh, it's meaningful to say that around that background, I'm in the quote vacuum for the fluctuations, meaning that around that background, I don't have any extra particles. Um, so, so that's the that's the distinction. But yeah. But look, I I want to press you to take this question a little more serious. Uh -huh. the, there's. Are we supposed to are we supposed to seriously understand this initial state as a vacuum state? Because if we do, then as far as I understand the definition of a vacuum state, what he says is right. It's an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Okay. It's it fails to be an eigenstate of all kinds of local you know, the talk of vacuum fluctuations is a little bit of an unfortunate misnomer, right? What's being really referred to there is the fact that there are all kinds of local observables of which the vacuum fails to be an eigenstate. Okay. But fluctuations involve some, some sense of time dependence. Mm -hmm. It's really a vacuum. is nothing like vacuum. The vacuum is, by definition, an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Yep. If we're talking about starting the universe out in something that's genuinely an eigenstate of the full Hamiltonian of the world, yeah, that I don't there's agree with. There's going to be a theorem that nothing's ever going to happen. Yeah, so that I don't agree with. It's not an eigenstate Good. of the Hamiltonian of the full world. Good. Yeah. Well, so so in what do we mean by calling it a vacuum? Uh, so it is, uh, the, I mean, there's a formal definition. So it's a so-called uh, adiabatic vacuum. Uh -huh. right? So things are evolving, but they're Perfect. evolving slowly enough that instantaneously I can define something that I call the vacuum. I see. Okay. Good. So, so how do we pick... That, so, so we don't think it because it has a special property of being a genuine eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. That's right. What are our considerations in picking it? Um, so there's a few. There's empirical. Uh -huh. So this Good. works. Good. That's one. Good. I think that's the most important one because we don't know really. Good. Um, another one is uh, that <clears throat> let's say uh, so we we haven't gotten into inflation yet, but Inflation lasts a certain amount of time, okay? And there's a mapping between stuff that happens at a given time and scales that we see today. Mm -hmm. So uh, inflation could have lasted a really long time, and it would make fluctuations on scales that are vastly larger than the ones that we observe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's fact number one. Now, it's true that if I start in a different state, so it's not this adiabatic vacuum and right. something else, that if I wait long enough, the, the, the fluctuations will basically look like they came from this vacuum on relevant scales. So the, this vacuum is an attractor, in a sense, right? So that I might have this initial transient epoch where I have all sorts of crazy stuff going on, and it, it's, not, it's not at all looking like it's in that vacuum. But then if I wait long enough, it will. Right. And then that's the relevant set of scales for what we observe today. But of course, it's an attractor over some range of Hilbert space. Uh, uh, there, there, there must be exact micro conditions you could pick that would take it that would take longer to fall in there or shorter to fall in there. Yeah, and there's some that are that are just totally different. So. Right. So it sounds like we're still going to be dealing not with a unique microscopic initial condition, but with some probability distribution. 
So there's some, th that's right, so there's some set of initial states that right. are sufficiently close right. to this vacuum that you'd get there, you know, in t by the end of the so, so we're still going to want some measure over those to know which ones we can neglect, to know which ones are the pathological ones, which yeah. ones are the crazy ones. That's right, and, and I mean, there is some classification of that, so there's another consideration, which is symmetry. So, um, so inflation, if it never ended, would give rise to a de Sitter space. And there are vacua that are invariant under the group that preserves the symmetry of de Sitter space, mm -hmm. the de Sitter group. Mm -hmm. And there's a unique classification of vacua that are de Sitter invariant. Okay? Uh, one of those is the, the, the vacuum that we know and that we love and works, which is called the Bunch Davies vacuum. Mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and then there's these other ones called the alpha vacua. It's a continuous family, family of other de Sitter invariant vacua. Um, but those are problematic because um, they have occupation numbers over the Minkowski vacuum at arbitrarily high momenta. So they're like infinitely different in energy than our universe today. <laughs> so if, if during inflation you occupy one of those vacua, um, it's hard to see how that would evolve into a universe that looks anything like what we see today. So, the combination of de Sitter invariant, uh, long enough inflation, and sort of, you know, not too far away from something that would look totally crazy, pretty much uniquely specifies mm -hmm. sticking in this prescription. Right. So, um, but it is stuck in. Right. No one purports to have a measure over those mm -hmm. conditions. Good. That's not anything. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to mention that what you're really, what you're talking about is the, the state of the quantum fields and not the metric in particular and, and the space time in general. Yeah, but well, I am talking about the linear fluctuations in the metric. That's yeah. right. But not not the background. Right. So that's the other nice thing, right? Which is that you don't have to you don't have to find the probability distribution over these homogeneous quantities. Okay, well, you can, you, can, you can think about those independently, because that's much harder. <laughs> right. You can think about these linear things right. independently of that right. question. So you can actually make progress, hopefully.